What things should you be training and why? Mickey with Kerry Trainer and Gunfighter Oil drew behind the cameras and editing desk a glorious late spring day in May out on the farm. Let's get right into it. So what things should you be training? I think let's first talk about what's important, what's our goal. So one of the things that uh, I try to keep in mind personally, but also bring to every carry trainer class is, what's the goal? What's the desired end state, if you will? My buddy Vern loves that phrase. What's the desired end state? Meaning, once I get all trained, where do I wanna be? What do I wanna be capable of? What problems do I wanna be capable of solving? Which brings up, what problems might you find yourself in front of? Somebody sent me a video today and they said, what would you do in this video? So I opened the video up, and it was horrific. It happened just this week in Florida, 1.40 something in the morning, you guys can look this up, and some guys, they looked hy hyper intoxicated, decide to go swim in a pond in South Florida in the middle of the night. If you know anything about gator country, don't go in ponds in the middle of the night. And this guy got his arm bitten off from mid humerus down, gone. These guys drag him out of the, the uh, pond. They're all inebriated. There's a dude with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth like, we got to tourniquet that thing. And nobody really knows what to do. The, the victim is clearly in shock and he's in trouble. How many people do you know have had their arm bit off by an alligator? Probably most of you are going to be like, nobody. How many of you know somebody that's been in a car wreck, had a heart attack, maybe has some other physical injury like a fall or something like that? We all know somebody, right? So stop the bleed. We should have stop the bleed training. We should have some very basic training for uh, CPR. And by basic, I don't mean uh, low level. I mean, you should be skilled at it, but the basics of CPR should be ingrained into your head. How do you use an AED? Uh, do you understand what happens throughout the phases of shock? Do you understand why things like hypothermia are important considerations even in South Texas on a 100 degree day? You might not think hypothermia is something to consider, but it is. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's a clue that you need to go do some learning. So in the Curie Trainer program, I, Here's my background, right? I've got a construction background. I was involved in some violence a few times as a young man, and it kind of opened my eyes up to the world. I've practiced various martial arts most of my life. Uh, currently, most of my martial arts experience or, or uh, effort is put into jujitsu. Shout out to my people at Alpha BJJ in Woodstock and my good coach, Dan Hart, who you can have come do a seminar at your school. Why I bring that up, is I kind of look at things from the perspective of how do I get myself home at night to my family, to my loved ones, to my uh, sofa, et cetera, so I can go about my life and live as long as I can. So my dominant thought is this. I want to live a long, full life. Long and full. Long and full. Full means I want both my arms. I'm not going to go swimming in alligator-infested ponds in the middle of the night, right? So don't do stupid things that expose us to risk. So you talk about training and all of the things that go with it, and oftentimes we think about fast draw strokes or certain fighting skills. What precipitates that? What comes before that? What leads us to the point that we're drawing, that we're fighting? And you could think of a million different scenarios, right? Uh, a mob type of a scenario like we keep seeing happening in America, a, a home break in, somebody holding you up in a parking lot, some type of ambush attack, right? So there's different types of activities. And then we start to talk about medical things. Like I said earlier, a fall, electrocution, drowning, car wreck, right? So there's all these different things. Then we have the whole violence side of things, being shot, stabbed, beaten, etc. Don't do things that are gonna expose you two needless issues. I commented the other day about something and somebody called me a snowflake, which is comical. I grew up in a farm region. I'm out here sitting in the beautiful countryside today, which I guess doesn't make me not a snowflake. I have cut trees commercially. I have uh, uh, run every type of heavy equipment used in residential construction you can think of. I have been on, on the sides of buildings hanging off by ropes 75 or 100 feet up making repairs. 
I have done rock climbing on sheer wall faces, uh, frickin' 100, 200 feet up. I'm not a snowflake, but any of those things that I do or have done in my life, you make good choices in equipment, in training, you make good choices in the execution of the task to limit your exposure to injury or death, right? You guys that are in the trades, you guys, gals, or a mechanic, I think is a great example. Do you climb under your car with just a hydraulic jack? The answer should always be no. You put a st solid, stable jack stand to hold the car up so that if the hydraulic system of the jacks breaks, it doesn't fall on you. People know this, but every year, jacks fail, tip over, the wheels are not chalked, the vehicle's not in park, or what if there's no transmission? What if there's no drive shaft? What if there's no rear end? Blah, blah, blah. All of these things, you gotta know what you're doing to involve yourself. So there's a level of knowledge that has to be had. My buddy Sang likes to say, you don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes, like these guys jumping in these ponds, maybe, maybe you're not aware of what's going on. So sometimes, for example, if you grow up in a warm climate and you don't know anything about snow or ice and you're up in the mountains in the wintertime and you don't realize that running out into a parking lot may put you on, on some sheer black ice that's gonna put you on your head or butt, you might do it not knowing it. Conversely, I'm a guy that grew up in the Midwest. I didn't see the ocean until I was 20 years old maybe. Of course, I'm aware of things from, from reading and learning about what's in the ocean, but you don't know, or I didn't know, hey, sh sh shuffle your feet on this beach because there's all kinds of rays that can sting you, or look out for urchins, or jellyfish, or whatever. You don't know because you're not exposed to that, that climate, that, that area, the, perhaps the culture. Maybe your behavior in a certain culture, you don't know you're doing something that's offensive. Why I'm bringing these things up is we need a knowledge of the world around us. We need a knowledge, or knowledge, pardon me, we need knowledge and a base of, of, of knowledge on what's going on around you. That's impossible to do for everything. You can't know all about construction, about mechanics, about medicine, about aviation, about different cultural things that might get you in a fight because you say or do the wrong thing. It's impossible, right? It's impossible to know all of those things. So we have to though try at the very least to develop a good understanding, which also brings up another point, some conduct. Is there a way to conduct ourselves in this world that'll help keep us out of most troublesome situations? Let's get down to like the weapons stuff. So I think that there's that, that front preloaded side of what we should do to be training. Let's talk about the backside. So like in the carry trainer program, here's one of the things that we talk about. We start out, what's your goal? Why am I here? What am I training for? Good. Now let's structure the physical training around it. By physical training, I'm talking about working with firearms. Does my draw stroke and the way that I have the stuff positioned on my body support me winning in violence? So here's a question I ask every student and I ask myself, are the choices I'm making in training getting me closer to the desired end state? Remember what we started out with, my desired end state, what's my goal? Do they get me closer or do they take me farther away? If they're not getting you closer, don't do them. Don't do them because they're not supporting your goal. If it's your goal, you want to get there. So we talk about things like our training. How do we access our gun, right? How do we access our gun? How do we put it on our body? How does the belt, the holster, and all of that stuff work together? What ammunition are we using? How are we presenting that pistol? How are we safely putting it away? These things matter. And if you don't think about it, if you're not mindful of it, what are you training? Something as simple as how you reload the gun Casually, I'm not talking about during a gunfight, just casually reload the gun. You are building and ingraining a system. So something that I, I harp on is let's create and instill a system, a way, if you will, that will become habitual the same way that you like your coffee, you pour your coffee a certain way, the same way that you go about uh, slicing your your food on a plate, the same way you go about getting in your car and adjusting mirrors. I want it to be so habitual that you don't have to think about these things. That said, the habits that we're working on need to help us win in violence. They need to be three things. Repeatable. Can I repeat this action? If my draw stroke is not something that I can do repeatably, well, then how's it gonna help me when I need it if I mess it up every other time? It needs to be reliable. It needs to be robust. Reliable and repeatable sound like the same thing, except they're not, because I can repeat bad 
functions. Reliable, what I mean by that is, is this thing something I can come back to over and over again and rely upon, right? I can repeat bad habits. I can rely on it because we know that it's founded in and built on good sound practices. Robust, what I mean by robust, when you think of robust, you probably think of like strong, right? Stout, does it stand up? to violence? Does it stand up to you possibly being adrenalized, possibly being hurt, concussed, bleeding, uh, dizzy, seeing stars? Does it stand up to that? Is the way you grip the gun, drive it out, retract it, etc., going to help you through that function? For talking about the carbine, the long gun, the rifle, when I start to work with folks on that, I'm really interested in the whole process, just like the pistol. Do you really understand how to zero this gun and why? Do you really understand how to hit something 50 yards away, 250 yards away with the setup do you, that you have? Do you fully understand the ballistic limitations of the ammunition and the platform, et cetera, that you're using? Do you understand the internal? right? The internal and external and terminal ballistics. If you don't know what all those words are, well, we're going to talk about that in the class, right? I need to know what that ammunition is capable of and what it's doing in, out, and when it hits whatever it's hitting. I think too often we think just about these manipulations, bam, 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 bam. But what leads up to it and builds this total system around us? Here's my thought. I want to keep myself out of trouble, but if trouble happens, I want to have a way to deal with it, be it clamping down an artery on somebody's arm that got bit wide open by a gator, be it helping out with somebody that is in cardiac arrest or, or having trouble breathing or maybe is going into anaphylactic shock and I need to get their EpiPen or, and get them help, be it to communicating to the police or to help in a way that they can understand me and I'm not out of control. Oh my God, something's happening. Can I keep myself calm? These are the things that we talk about in training. And then we move on to the mechanical skills. Can I run these guns in a way that I can get done what needs doing? Can I still pay attention to the world around me and still make good choices? Can I communicate effectively? These are the things that are important to me. I hope some of these things are important to you. I hope that these topics maybe stir you a little bit to think about these very important concepts and ideas that could keep you alive should you find yourself in a perilous, crummy situation. Here's a couple things that I know for sure. If you watch this video to the end, the world needs people like you. Not because you're watching Mickey, who cares about me, but because you're thoughtful about the fact that you possibly may be the last hope for your family, for yourself, for some stranger to get out of a really crummy, crappy situation. You're thinking about that. Not because you want to be a hero, not because you want to be uh, you know, some Batman savior to somebody, but because you care about other people. Because you care that when you lay your head down at night or your children look at you, they know my dad, my mom is the kind of person that does the right thing. Not because other people are watching, but because it's the right thing. And that is what makes the world a better place. Not because you carry a gun, not because you pound your chest and say Second Amendment this or Second Amendment that, but because you care about the people that live around you, because you care about the people in your community, because you care about being an example to your kids, to your kids' friends, to the people that work around you, and again, not because you get something out of it, but because it's the right thing to do. I think you're that kind of person and I dig that I get to chat with you. If you've got questions on anything we do, if you've got question on our, questions on our classes, pardon me, carrytrainer.com for information on that. I strongly suggest that you train your body physically to be as sturdy and strong as you can be, as long as you can be. You don't need to run marathons or Ironmans to do that. Do a little a lot, like my friend Z likes to say, or Paul Sharp. Invest 5, 10, 15 minutes in air squats while you're brushing your teeth. Do some push-ups while you're waiting for, for the conference call to start. Do some stretching while you're waiting for the bus for the kids to get home, etc. Do that stuff frequently, and you will find that there's going to be big changes in your life. Help yourself get to sleep earlier by shutting these phones off. Rest. Your body needs rest. Find solace in nature. Every great thinker, poet, author, teacher from Jesus Christ to Marcus Aurelius to the great writers of, 
of the early years of America all found that nature restores our mind, our soul, helps us find peace and center, center ourselves in this world. Go dig that stuff. Even if you live in the city, there's a park in town. There's a park where there's some birds and some bees and you can go sit amongst the trees. Go do that. Mickey with CarryTrainer.com. Like I said, Drew behind the editing desk. Hope this chat was valuable to you. Just some thoughts on some things I think you should be training. Be well. Don't be dickheads. Tell somebody you love them. Bye now. Industry focuses on the door, and that's where all their weight is, and all their they show all the bolts and you know, corner bolts and all the stuff that you cannot pry these open. Take a circular saw, cheap circular saw with a carbide blade. And we've got videos on this. It's a $20 blade. I cut a gun safe completely in half. It's a big safe. It's a minute, 20 seconds, and I cut a 12-inch hole in the side in 18 seconds. A determined thief who knows you have a safe will, will open it up in minutes. That's not, that's not why you have a safe. Now, we look at storage from a different standpoint. Um, secure it. You know, and that's our, going back to our military, how, how and why the military stores firearms. If you're going to store firearms in your home or secure them, Secure them in a method or in a way that gives you an advantage, that puts you at a tactical advantage. Most people own firearms. One of the reasons is home defense. Even your avid hunter say, well, I'm a hunter, but if something breaks in, I still want a firearm. So store them in a way that, that gives you an advantage. And we use our term as principles of decentralized storage. Break up the safe. Store in small modular cabinets located throughout your home. Mm -hmm. Put you in a much, you're much safer. The guns are safer for a lot of reasons we can go into, and you're never more than three seconds away from a firearm that is truly child safe. What's the method of entry into these safes? Is there uh, more we, than use, one? We, we use simple push button locks. Okay. No, no, um, like the fingerprint readers we would never use. Yeah. We consider this never fail technology. If somebody is in your house with a gun shooting at you, it has to open in, in, in a second or two. You don't have in a fingerprint reader, if your fingers are dirty, wet, gloves, there's so many reasons they won't open. Mm -hmm. 